So today we're not going to do a normal vlog because I have a special guest with me today right here. So let me introduce her first. This is Dr. Dina Shazanaho. She has been practicing uh, medicine for how many years now? Medicine for almost five years, four, four plus. Yeah, and she has been working in the obstetrics obstetrics and gynecology department for two years now. Yes. Delivered. Roughly about how many babies? I don't know. I think probably <laughs> hundreds, if not thousands. Yeah. But yeah, but I'm no pro. And she's my sister-in-law. Mm -hmm. uh, we're gonna start with um, some questions that I've uh, compiled from my followers on Instagram because I've asked them. You know, do you have any burning questions that you you know you don't know how to ask your gynae or you're just too shy to ask? So we'll be asking her instead today. Ten questions for Dr. Dina. Let's start with the first one. <laughs> the first one is, uh, when should I see a doctor after a positive UPT? Well, disclaimer, I'm with the government. <laughs> so I would advocate to go to a government hospital. Um, even if you're planning to deliver in a private sector, I think it's still good for you to um, have a pink book with yeah. the clinic because I think I think Jasmine can like yeah. put a thingy on the pink yeah. book here as soon as you get a positive pregnancy test you should go and get a scan done because the earlier we can date the baby on a scan the more accurate it's going to be but should they just like take a few uh, P-stick tests instead of just one before going um, to the doctor well I think the accuracy of the P-stick tests like this is like from my own personal experience um, the cheaper ones are actually less accurate, I can vouch for that because when I had my first son, I am like on the dot on time I'm like, so the day I missed my period, like the next day, I went to get a pregnancy test so I bought two, I bought the cheap like six ringgit stick and I bought the like clear 40 blue bucks, one. yeah, clear blue one clear blue one was positive and the cheap piece stick was negative Thank you. so like that's on the same day, like the same P, okay, not even like pagi P, petam P, it's like the same P on two sticks and one was positive and one was negative. This is because the sticks actually detect your pregnancy hormone, it's called beta HCG. So what happens when you pee on a cheap stick, those sticks tend to like read a higher level of beta HCG. So the further along you are, the higher your hormone goes. So that's why like when you take it later, you get a positive on a cheap stick. But those expensive sticks will read a lower HCG level. So the moment it goes up a bit, like really early pregnancy, you can already tell that you're pregnant. Yeah. But mind you, like if say you're you just missed your period about a week ago and then you go and get a scan, some government clinics might not do a scan first. They might just repeat the pregnancy test again. And if it's positive, they'll say, Okay, come back in two weeks. Because your first trimester is between like zero to thirteen weeks. So as long as you do a scan below like that 13 week mark you should be fine so sometimes when you scan at like four or five weeks you might not say anything yet and then we don't want to give you like false hope or anything so normally we scan about six seven weeks onwards so the second question is is it safe to dye our hair during pregnancy <laughs> you know what this is funny because like i would ask my hairdresser that like oh is it safe to do that i would ask yeah. my doctor i think as a hard and fast rule i would generally say to stay away from like anything chemical, chemical fumes. yeah fumes massages like, like it's not scientifically proven but i would say to stay away from those in the first 13 weeks not because the pregnancy is fragile per se but because the baby's organs are developing during that 13 week period so you know any exposure to like medication um, fumes what that happens during that 13 week period might affect the baby's organs whereas if you do it like second trimester onwards and the vital organs are already in place you are not affecting the baby's organ growth so much let's move on to the third question which is quite 
a good question <laughs> because I want to know this. <laughs> okay. Okay. How to know that you're in labor and when to go to the hospital? Okay. So there are three signs of labor. The first is that you have regular contractions that are getting more and more like closer together and they're getting more intense. So we would advocate like contractions that are at least 10 minutes apart, okay, regular contractions that are 10 minutes apart and that are getting um, more like stronger in the sense that like oh if they're 15 seconds don't bother. But if they are, you know, 30 seconds, every contraction is lasting for 30 to 40 seconds, every 10 minutes, then come in. Um, I think it would be good for first time mothers. Uh, this is like for first time mothers, okay? Like second, third time mothers, don't do this because like takut you to beranakan rumah. But like first time mothers, I think it would be good to wait it out maybe one or two hours and really see that they are regular contractions that are 10 minutes apart and going closer, maybe 8 minutes, 6 minutes, 4 minutes, okay, for coming in. Um, the second sign is your water breaks. This is really important. Water breaking, like don't tunggu 2 days, 3 days, water break, please come to us, okay? Because like, I have people who, like, oh, saya rasa I ketuban pecah semalam, but then like, baby was okay, I was not having contractions, so it's okay, no. Because once your water breaks, that is the sac that covers the baby from the outside environment. So that sac breaks, it's important for you to get assessed. Okay? And takut like, especially like when the water breaks, you got to know the time, the colour of the water that's coming out. If it's greenish, just please come in straight away. Then the third thing is um, a show. A show is basically like blood jump over pits. And that happens when your cervix, which is like long, is becoming like shorter and shorter. The medical term is like called effacement. So as the cervix effaces, um, like this kind of like discharge of blood plus because like period and then habis comes out. So once you have that uh, coupled with contractions, you should come in. That alone, you can actually wait on it, but that with contractions, you can come in. And then like the last thing is just to be aware of baby's movements. Sometimes even like when you're already term, which is like 37, 38 weeks onwards, if you're already term, you're not having contractions, you're not having sure, you're not having any fluid, but your baby is not moving as actively as the baby was moving, then you should come and get checked. Because once you're 37, 38 weeks and baby's not moving as much, we can do something about it. Like, is it true that once you start having contractions that you can actually be in labor for another day or a few more days before you can actually go to the hospital? <laughs> yes, <laughs> especially for first time mums. Like it's really normal to have, yeah, like, a, a, it's, it's actually not called labour labour. Your labour is actually two parts. You've got latent phase and you've got active phase. So that active phase is actually when you're having strong contractions and you're dilated 4 centimeters and above. So once you're like dilated 4 centimeters with those contractions, then you should deliver within 8 to 12 hours. But that latent phase, that 1 cm, 2 cm, 3 cm, that can go on for days. Sometimes people have contractions for one day, then the next day it dies down. Then you're probably in false labor. And like false labor can be brought on by like a urine infection, stress can be brought on by dehydration. So it's normal to be like 1 cm, 1 cm, 1 cm for many, many days. Yeah, everyone. If you're already in labor even though you active labor yet, um, can you like just admit yourself to the ward? Like, I know the doctors will say you, you, you'll be more comfortable at home, you know, all um, that. Well, actually it depends, like where I'm practicing, once you have contractions, we actually keep you in the hospital so that we can monitor you because some babies become stressed by having contractions so they have changes in their speech. Whatever you're comfortable with, follow your gut instinct. Um, it's not wrong to ask to be admitted. Paling important once you start having all these labor signs, um, watch out on the The fourth question, how to remain calm during contractions so that you don't push too early? How to remain calm during contractions? Oh my <laughs> god. Speaking from a personal standpoint, I was induced. So I had contractions for like two to three days and my contractions were like every three to five minutes. And I hate 
I hate drugs because it makes me like Ooh. so I res I refused drugs. So I had to the contractions and I think the best way to tahan contractions is actually to like breathe through it. It's it's actually true. The breathing through contractions really helps. Don't do that like <laughs> that one is like that's hyperventilating, you're gonna get dizzy. It's like deep breath in slow slowly exhale. Okay, that's like best either, okay? Like that really helps. From a medical standpoint, once you are even in native phase, even if you're not in the labor room yet, but you need drugs, um, there are a number of drugs that we can offer you. Um, in the ward we normally go for intramuscular injections. So it's usually pethidine or tramadol. With pethidine, you do get a bit, you know, with tramadol also, you do get a bit woozy. So it's not really, it's not really like hilang kan sakit. It's more like you get so drowsy and sleepy that you don't realise that you're still in pain. Once you're in the labour room, you get the gas. You can ask for the gas. We always advocate to start inhaling the gas when you feel like a contraction is coming not at the height of the contractions. So your contractions are going to like build up like a wave and then they're going to come down again. So that start of the wave, when you feel, you you will know that like, okay, I'm going to have a contraction now. You start the dot gas too. Um, so that at the peak of the contractions, the pain is not as intense. And then when you're in the labor room, of course, like first time mothers, I personally ad would advocate for epidural. Epidural is like, I didn't have it, but my patients who have had epidural memang is the best. My colleagues who have gone through labor, even though they are second, third time like this, they ask for the epidural as soon as they got to labor. So you know, don't be scared of the epidural. It is like your best friend. Your best friend. <laughs> and it doesn't make you drowsy. It doesn't make you sleepy. You're like fully awake, you're fully sane, you're fully like not dizzy. You can fully enjoy the labor process without feeling any pain. So like I am like a big advocate for epidural. So I said that especially during the ring of fire <laughs> where the baby is crowning coming out. And so you're not supposed to push so hard. You have the urge to push like yeah. like you cannot tahan that thing because you're not okay. But have you ever <laughs> have you guys ever like like baru makan lepas raya punya meal? You really 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 have to go by it. Ah, uh, it's like. People liken it to that, like pushing a baby out is actually like pushing like you are constipated, the most constipated that you've ever been in your life. Like constipation, okay. What happens when you are already pushed is that you're gonna get this like sense of you need to poop <laughs> because the baby's head is essentially like you can imagine this is the baby's head, okay? And like you know your baby's head is actually where your like, pardon my language, where your shit comes out. Mm -hmm. So like, your baby's head is essentially pushing the bayi punya canal. So that's why you feel like, oh my god, I need to berak, I need to berak so bad. The thing is, this doesn't just happen when you're fully dilated. There are some people, their cervix becomes really, really thin, really, really effaced. So the baby's head is really, really, really low. So bila kepala baby is like really low, but the jalan is still like say 5-6 centimeters you're not ready to push yet. You cannot push a baby out unless you are 10 centimeters dilated. A baby's head cannot draw at 6 cm, 7 cm. It has to be like 10 centimeters before you push. So when you have this like sensation to like pass motion, tapi you are only like 6, 7 centimeters, you have to breathe through it. Just like, just breathe through it. If you really feel like you cannot tahan, if you really feel like you got to poop so badly, ask your midwife to check. Because, um, one, it could be that like you have progressed that fast and you're actually ready to push. Number two, it could be that like you actually have shit there. That's why you actually feel like you got to poop. So they can actually evacuate the shit for you. Um, or number three, they can tell you like, okay, look, you're six centimeters, you're almost there, but your head's like really low already. So breathe through it. So they'll tell you what to do next. So coming to the fifth question, which is related as well. Uh, how will I know when to push? Sama juga macam this now. Like, you will have that 
sensation that you need to bear down it's called the bearing down sensation once you have that like really urge to bear down you tell the midwife they'll assess you and if you are fully dilated they'll tell you okay go ahead coming to the sixth question <laughs> why <laughs> why women poop when giving birth and how to avoid it mm -hmm. these three questions are a bit related mm -hmm. Hey, please makan before you go to labor room because you need the energy. So don't like, oh, I don't want to eat because I'm scared of shit. No such thing. Please mm -hmm. makan before you go to the labor room. Most labor rooms, once you reach there, you're not allowed to makan anymore, but you're allowed to minum air. It depends on where you deliver. The center that I'm practicing at now, we don't routinely give an enema. An enema is like this wet to clear your bowel. But there are, I think most private hospitals, they routinely give an enema. An enema is this wet that like, it's like jelly-ish and they shoot it up your bum <laughs> and, and like, you will perch you will like be bum <laughs> immediately to attack yes oh, really? otherwise um yeah it's kind of inevitable <laughs> <laughs> don't be embarrassed we see it like okay like see on a daily basis if i'm on call in labor room and i deliver say like 50 babies out of 50 maybe 10 to 12 would shit oh. <laughs> you know like 10 to 12 moms would like shit while they're pushing so it's and and they are all fat or whatever you know and and they'd be like oh sorry 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 i'm like no 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 it's like you have no idea how used to it i am so yeah it's fine seventh question i think a lot of people want to know this including myself how do you avoid tearing like the manual tears oh from a medical standpoint like the doctor would control the tearing by you only encourage the mom to push when the head is really low and the mom is really Number two would be like the mom has to listen to the doctor. So if the doctor says, okay, push now, you push now. Because you have to push with your contraction. If you are not having a contraction and you start pushing, the baby's not going to descend. Basically, you need like a contraction plus your pushing for the baby to calm down. Okay, number three, like learn how to push. If you push skijab skijab, the baby's head is going to come down. And then the moment you stop pushing, it's gonna like sort of retract back up. And then push like hit the bottom of it, must be retract back up. And all this much trauma soap, trauma soap, trauma soap is mangy selling against your perineum. Right. Right. So it's gonna like become like pecha pecha. Oh. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. It's actually good to like go for prenatal classes where they teach you how to push. And at home, you can practice much like, holding your breath um, and pushing for ten seconds. And then like, curi nafas, sambung teran. Curi nafas, sambung teran. Like, use that contraction to the maximum. So if your contraction lasts, say, 45 seconds, you should be able to get three good pushes in that 45 seconds. How about like, position-wise? You said not to angkat buntut, right? Hmm. Don't angkat buntut. Angkat buntut, you're gonna tear to the tumbuh. Okay, like, if you touch fire, your first instinct is like, to retract. So, once somebody touches you down there, your first instinct is, it's like whoop and then you sort of terangkat your punggung you have to keep in your mind like jangan kat punggung, jangan kat punggung, jangan kat punggung wait, what are the things you can do to prime sort of you prime right. your um, down there okay, when we talk about like perineal massage I think in labour I wouldn't advocate for perineal massage but I have read papers where like if you do perineal massage from 34 weeks onwards it helps to soften your perineal walls so um, there's less pain during your recovery so lepas you lepas, lepas you dah beranak macam you macam kurang sakit dekat tempat yang you beranak tu it's not that it controls tearing per se but there is less need for the doctor to perform an episiotomy apparently um, first time of this if they do a perineal massage within me for 24 weeks um, that being said I think all OBGYN doctors have it at the back of their minds if this is the first time mother we're not going to routinely gunting. We will gunting if it looks like you need a gunting. And don't be scared because actually by us doing that episiotomy, it controls your tearing. We gunting people who we think that either the baby cannot claw mm. or she will tear too much if you do gunting. Let's move on to the eighth question. How to clean or care for your wound of episiotomy mm. postpartum? That's a good question. Episiotomies require sutures and your sutures are going to dissolve by themselves. How to juggle the luka? Number one, we don't um, advocate using like, 
feminine wash apa semua tu Warm water Duk warm water macam ni Not like ke arah sejuk nak ke arah panas It's fine After you wash it Let it dry um, And then you can sapu the No no don't No don't sapu anything <laughs> Don't sapu Don't 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 like Sampai kau sapu minyak gamat lah Sampai kau sapu like minyak Don't know what lah But got some sort of minyak lah Daun lah don't know what lah Don't sapu anything Just use warm water And 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 cuci and let it dry. That's enough. You don't have to do more than that. Change your pad frequently. Then you're going to have all the darah inside skin. Change your pad, even if it's not like soaked. Change it every two to three hours. Doesn't matter. Check with a mirror. Kalau you jenis yang tak geli, you you don't mind checking for yourself. Get yourself a mirror. Hang on the mirror. Put it down there, and you can see how well the luka is healing. If you see like the Buka tu nak terbuka balik It's called gapping Or if you see any like yellowish discharge coming out from the buka Get the nurses or get your doctor to have a check This is why it is so 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 important To make use of our healthcare system Because once you open a buku pink Yang masa you pregnant tu Once you dah run out You just give the clinical setan call and say like Oh look I've delivered um, The first 10 days of your delivery They will come every other day and then they'll come again day 15, they'll come again day 20. So that's like if every other day for 10 days, and then 5 days after that. And then day 30, you will actually go to the clinic seven for your baby's first injection. This is for all, for this is for all mothers. All mothers. Like, so how many times? So that's why it's really, really good to, to book up book. There's nurse, if you had a cesarean section, she will check your luka caesar. If you had a, like a gunting bawah, she will check your luka bawah. So, and then she will check like whether you're pale or not, whether your uterus is well contracted or not. She'll check your blood pressure. And then when she's done checking you, she'll check the baby. The third thing for like luka bawah is called a sits bath. Um, so this sits bath is actually like you take a basin and then you put it on water and you put garam. And then you like chapu 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 until it's all like, Normal garam? Normal garam, like table salt. And you rendam your luka inside that table salt for a few minutes. Tak yalah macam for a few minutes and then uh, you wash it off with normal pipe water and then you dab 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 and then you wet your pad again and then like how how frequently should you do it um, you can do it like three times a day but even if you do it once for example uh, the ninth question uh, <laughs> tips on conceiving a baby okay tips for conceiving I would say there's a female factor and a male factor so let's talk about the female factor first if you have any problems with your period uh, get that address first because in order to conceive your periods should be regular number two is your weight management generally the more obese you become the less fertile you are because obesity uh, interferes with your hormones it's always good to be healthy before you embark on a pregnancy yeah. because you're going to need to be fit yeah. to like be pregnant and deliver what else for girls? Prenatal vitamins? Uh, yes. Oh my god, thank you. Prenatal vitamins. Folic acid is life. Folic acid is actually important for the baby punya neural development. The development of the baby's brain and spinal cord. The problem is that a lot of people start taking folic acid once they know they're pregnant. And the time that you know you're pregnant, you're probably like five weeks along, six weeks along, yeah. if you're lucky. Most mothers, like, they probably only know when they're like 8-9 weeks along. Lapa minggu, like your baby's spinal cord does start to form. Your baby's brain does start to form. Uh, you only have like another 5 weeks, because the, the first trimester then, where the organs are being formed, you only have another 5 weeks for it to become like completely form form. Anybody who's trying to get pregnant, just start taking yeah. folic acid now. Oh, what's the dosage? Um, okay, actually, actually, there are two um, there are two dosages of folic acid. There's high dose folate and low dose folate. High dose folate is the one that is like the pills that we give in the clinic. Those are five milligrams of folate a day. The ones that are inside, like your obimin, um, inside your um, iberet, inside your multivitamins. The ones that you have one pill that has like B complex, uh, vitamin C, zinc, magnesium, everything. Those actually have low dose folate. Those have like. 400 micrograms of folate, okay. yeah. So that's like one tenth of what you get from a high dose folate. But our body has folate from like normal food stores. So unless you are somebody who has, which underlying epilepsy, problem, or you have had a baby before 
who has had a neural tube problem, spina bifida, or like you've had a baby die of anencephaly, yang brain sparrow tu, you should take high dose folate from like preconception. But if you are like you've never had a pregnancy before, or all your children sebelumnya are sihat, then you can take the low dose folate. It's okay, right? Throughout pregnancy, but if you have like pre-existing medical conditions, diabetes especially. Please, please, please make sure your diabetes is well controlled before embarking on a pregnancy because high sugar affects baby when you're open development. So you can have babies with heart problems, with spine problems, just because like you didn't control your sugar. And it's so easily avoided. That's the female factor. What about the male factor? Um, male factor, if you're staying with your partner, like not like PJJ, um, and you have like regular TMI, <laughs> you have regular intercourse like three to four times a week. You know that your periods are regular. You know that you're not like obese. You don't perceive any problems, um, and you've been trying for a good. Ooh, somebody's ah, ah. Uh, And you've been trying for a good two years. Then you should uh, get you and your husband checked. Um, husband period checking is just a sperm analysis. If your husband's a smoker. I mean that could be a factor, so you can get your husband to stop smoking. Please, please, please stop smoking. I mean not just to get pregnant, but also like for the other health benefits of not smoking. Oh my baby is out! But okay, the last question, the tenth question. Emma, you wanna answer this? <laughs> Three things you wish first time mothers knew. Um, the first thing, let's start from like when you baru baru pregnant. I wish that well, I, I think most mothers know this, but I think there are still like some like unaware people out there. Number one, please, please track your period so that you know when was your last period. The piling accurate way to date a pregnancy is by calculating when was their last period. And when the doctors ask you when was your last period, it is the not the last day, okay? It is the first day of that period. Say your period was from like 1st of June till 5th of June. Your last menstrual period, LMP, is 1st of June. It's not that hard actually. There's a lot of apps you can download to help track your period. The second thing I wish people knew was counting your baby's kicks. Because I've had like people, like especially young mothers, like maybe 20 years old, first pregnancy, like 19 weeks, 20 weeks they come. But baby tak gerak. At 20 weeks, your baby's like maybe 200 grams. <laughs> so like it's not, it's normal that you don't feel them move. When should you start being aware of your fetal movements? We advocate starting to count fetal kids at 28 weeks. We can start like monitoring the CTG from 32 weeks. Please don't go to your doctor at like 25 weeks and say, oh my baby's not moving. Like we really, we can't really do anything. Do anything yet. I mean like, okay, to be honest, as a first time mother, I was also like very aware of his movement. Because no, that's the worst. Way. Yeah, it's kind. Of, it's like you don't want anything bad to happen to your baby. Then, so I remember like before I was pregnant, and mothers came to me at like twenty five weeks and go like, "Bro, this one of the girl, how you do that I'll be like so annoyed because I'm like, "Oh my god, at twenty five weeks, what can I do?" But then after being pregnant and like feeling his kids for myself, Baru, I started to understand like how how much variety there can be and how worried a mom can be. As a general rule. 28 weeks we start fighting for the movements but if you do feel any changes and you're worried it's okay to come and bother us we will check uh, the fetal heart and we'll do a scan for you to make sure everything's okay because according to guidelines actually your kick should be like 10 kicks in 2 hours though, not 10 kicks in 12 hours uh, I would I would be able to say from experience now that every mother will have different yeah. habits like the baby will have different habits like Okay, last thing you wish was that mother's name. How to push. <laughs> okay, like the paling annoying thing, I swear to God, is when mothers come to the labor room and they want to push, but when we ask them to push, they blow out. So they go like... <gasps> like that's not pushing. Okay? <laughs> when you push, you're supposed to take a deep breath, hold that breath in, and push like while your breath is not your past it's not like that's not pushing okay don't blow in your doctor's face or your nurse's face <laughs> that, oh. oh, that happens a lot man okay 
Jasmine, yeah. um, how did you find out you were pregnant? Oh my god. Did you have a hunch? I did not have a hunch, okay guys. And FYI, this pregnancy was not planned, but Alhamdulillah, you know, Rizuki. Um, I found out, well, I, I did not have much like, of regular period style. So, I always have much like, of lambat, cepat lambat, cepat lama, cepat pendek. So, macam, so, at that time, last year, November, my period was late for, I think, a week kot. So, I macam, hmm, nak kena check ke tak ni? Because I was in the middle but of... But you track your periods? Uh, you yeah, track. I do track my periods through an app. So, macam, every time I get my period, I terus keep what in semua. What app uh, Flow. And then it has a pregnancy mode. Macam tukar. <laughs> cool lah. Oh, okay. Uh, cool. Uh, once you're pregnant. Um, so, I was in the middle of a, macam, basketball training for the tournament. And I just, actually, I just bought, I just bought new shoes on the day I decided to buy a pregnancy. Why did you buy like shoes before buying a pregnancy test? Because I needed those shoes to go to the training. So I just start training for a while macam tu. So I needed new shoes. So it was on my to-do list. You know how I am with my list. <laughs> yeah. So macam I beli lah. And then macam oh, lalu lalu pharmacy macam oh, he beli lah And so by that too, um, Danny was with me lah throughout the whole time. So in, uh, inside the toilet, while peeing, macam okay. Eh, macam, miss you, macam, it's not even a negative test. Have you had negative tests before? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, a lot of times. Oh, you've had negative tests before? I've had negative tests. Like, were you sad when the tests came out negative? Not, not sad, because we were not trying to conceive, per se, but like, after a while of like, negative uh, and then late periods, uh, we were quite like, well, sad, but a bit worried because uh, I've been off <laughs> under sad this for a while, quite a long while, like, a year, a solid year at yeah, least. Yeah. So much we were getting a bit worried. Like is there something but, wrong with me? Uh, like, is there something wrong with me? Should I get myself checked? But like being said, you have to wait like two years. Yeah, when you're off depot. Yeah. Off, uh, yeah. Because I was I was on depot uh, program I am. I was never on pills or any of that other contraceptives. So that pregnancy test turned out positive. So I was like and then you Was it clear blue? <laughs> yeah, it was clear blue. Did you I only bought... try clear blue or did you try a No, one I two? bought clear blue the rose because I did not have a hunch but I just bought clear blue because macam because it's accurate again. So macam because plus I was in the basketball practice, so macam I cannot afford to you know have false negative kind of thing. <laughs> so I just bought clear blue. Tiba positive macam tu lah. Macam macam. Ah, ni. He followed you into the toilet. Yeah, he was in the toilet macam tengah bos gigi aku ni. I'm just tengah feeling like we were getting oh, ready. Oh, it was at home. It wasn't like at it the was basketball. It was at Auntie Jen's place. Okay? Oh my god. <laughs> Did you go for practice that night? Uh, I was supposed to, but I tak pergi lah. Uh, I just went, lepas tu I cakap dengan team, I cannot, you know, I cannot masuk because da 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 Did you tell them that you were pregnant then and there? No, no, no. I waited for the next, uh, next training session, I think. So I cakap I cannot come anymore. So, just lah. I did not have a hunch. That's how I found out I was pregnant. Like, did you have like, like food cravings before you knew you were pregnant? No, you no, know? no. Everything felt really normal actually. Macam no morning sickness. No morning sickness. No. Yeah, no. Nothing at all. But after the test, not mental or psycho, but after the test, like I think a few days after the test, immediately, like, I'm going to And then, oh my yeah, god. Yeah, her morning sickness was horrible, really bad. horrible, horrible, horrible. Not just morning, man. All day, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't get out of bed. The minute <laughs> that's I woke so up, that's me. the minute I woke up, that's all. It's all I think about. Like, do not puke, do not puke, do not puke. For three months. Yes. Okay, guys. <laughs> <laughs> where where does Justin plan to deliver? Yeah. I plan to deliver uh, at the same hospital with the same doctor. As in, not not where I work. As in like yeah, I mean, yeah where I where deliver. She delivered. Where I deliver him. It's gonna be in his UK. Oh, yeah. So um, we will show you around his UKM and the room and the delivery suite in her delivery vlog. Future vlog. <laughs> Inshallah. I'm gonna be like all YouTube here so like <laughs> subscribe to her <laughs> channel. Click <laughs> the oh, notifications <laughs> and if you like this video give it a thumbs up. <laughs> Thanks for watching guys. Bye. Bye. I'm at Dubai. Bye. I'm at Dubai. Bye. Bye. Okay, she's good. Bye. 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 Bye.